All right, well, welcome to this last talk of the day on um, cross-platform development, iOS, Android, and Java with Team Foundation Server and Team Explorer Everywhere. Who am I? Uh, well, I'm a general troublemaker. I'm a partner with MCW Technologies. We're a consultancy focused primarily on Microsoft uh, stuff. This is Microsoft stack in the end. And I'm a Microsoft MVP for the ALN stack. So I focus on Team Foundation Server, the online ser service Visual Studio Online, and of course, all the things around building software better. So quality, uh, tracking your work, project management, that kind of stuff. I'm a member of Pluralsight's technical staff. I'm recording a course on Visual Studio Online. And I'm the co-author of the just released Professional ALM 2013 for Fox. So you can go out and buy that if you want. Uh, contact information is down at the bottom of the slide. Um, all the slides will be available from the conference website, et cetera, as well as on my blog. And uh, you can harass me as you see fit. So the first thing to do is make sure we level set and understand what ALM is and how this fits into the big picture. So when we think about software development, as developers, we've often been focused on the SELC, the software development lifecycle, which is typically considered from the time you start coding until you ship or release. The industry at large over the last five, seven years has started thinking beyond that. We've matured in some of the baseline processes, right? Modern teams that are showing basic maturity are using things like version control, um, using build servers, those types of things. But as we've evolved, we started thinking about, well, there's much more than just the SDLC, and that's where application lifecycle and management comes in. We're starting thinking about software from the idea point or from birth all the way through the creation process the shipping process and that iterative ship new releases process to ultimately that product is taken out of commissions, is, you know, basically dies. Um, ALM encompasses obviously the software development processes, but also includes business processes, right? How do we think about governance? Uh, how do we manage the application? How do we manage the resources, the developers, the people that go into building software? How do we manage a software project when it's a part of a larger project? Think airplane manufacturing, right? Modern aircraft like the Airbus A380, the Boeing's Triple Seven, have huge portions of the project dedicated to the software development process. Yet, in the scale of things, it is a line item in the larger process of building a new aircraft. And so, organizations need to be able to see visibility into the projects, but might not care about how they're done. And so, ALM is about that entire process. And in the industry at large, we have players like Microsoft, IBM, HP, and some others that are producing end-to-end -end solutions. And then you also have other uh, companies, a good example would be GitHub, which is focused on a particular area and is slowly branching out in these, in these areas. And so the issue at large calls it ALM. And Microsoft has rebranded their core development stack to include that concept. And they use Team Foundation Server as their ALM hub. So when we think about what is TFS, TFS is Microsoft's Team Foundation Server. It was first released in um, March of 2006 as part of what was at that time called Team System. And over the last few years, it's evolved. The current release is Team Foundation Server 2013. Uh, we have Update 2, which is going to ship fairly soon and continues to bring enhancements. And what you have here is all the core features you would want in an ALM hub. You have tools for planning. You have tools for source code management. Work item tracking, so your bugs, your tasks, your requirements are all available. The ability to do things like continuous deployment, build automation, and even gather feedback from users are all core features of the server. As you can see in that blue band that goes at the top, you can apply whatever process makes you happy. Out of the box, they provide what are called process templates that provide guidance and basic structure for how you develop your software. So they have an Agile template, a Scrum template, and something based upon CMI. That said, when you use the server, you can customize and kind of bend it to your will. On top of that, primary gateways to the server are Visual Studio and Team Explorer Everywhere, which we're gonna look at here today. And then they have additional clients such as the web browser, uh, custom client applications, and tools like SharePoint that can interact with the server as well as those are things that can be built. Now, the downside of Team Foundation Server is this is something that has to be installed in your organization. To be used effectively, it requires a Windows Active Directory domain. 
And ultimately, it is a server product that requires care and feed. So Microsoft, like a lot of people out there, has started rethinking their product line. And Microsoft has taken Team Foundation Server and moved it to the cloud. It's been in public preview for the last couple of years. My team and I have been using it uh, for, well, that's going to be three years. And as of November 2013, it officially went general release. Um, for those customers that were already involved, they didn't have an early adopter program. But if you sign up today, then you have a price instruction that allows you to uh, license and have access to it. The key thing about Visual Studio Online is that it lets you do LM your way. We have all these features in Team Foundation Server that are also now available in Visual Studio Online. The key thing is that if you notice these two different bands, are the purple band and the blue band. The purple band represents the unique ways that things are done on premises with Team Foundation Server. <coughs> For example, today we have lab management, a feature that allows you to use Windows virtual machines in conjunction with Team Foundation Server to do testing um, and um, operational readiness of your application. On the other hand, in the cloud, we have a build service that's elastic where the build servers are dynamically allocated on demand as you need them. There's a load testing service. We have continuous deployment to Azure. We have a new feature called Application Insights that you can use to monitor your public facing properties as well as applications that have internet capability and gather metrics about them. We also have code editing online and a new feature that is codenamed Monaco that allows you to work on your Git enabled source code projects in the web browser. So to do editing, et cetera. And this is something that they continue to enhance. If you take a look at what they have in SharePoint Online, they use the same core editor to provide you with an online editing experience that allows you to do a bunch of work in the browser. And if necessary, you can take that project and go down to Visual Studio. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio Online for all the demos here, mostly because it's going to be better run as your server. But just about everything I'll show you, and if there's anything different I'll point out, is available on premises, so you have the choice. The benefit of the cloud is you don't have to maintain the server. It's not something that you have to install, you don't have to back up. You don't have to actually try resource, right? Backups aren't interesting resource, they're what's really sexy. And sadly, just about every customer I encounter when I come into on-site consulting, yeah, they think they've got it backed up, but uh, when we actually try to do a restore, well, another thing is coming. In particular, when you have to think about disaster recovery, how do you bring a new server online inside your domain? Now, when we start thinking about how you're going to work with this, a lot of versions of Visual Studio are supported, including 2013. Eclipse is supported. There's what's called the Visiting Provider for older Windows clients, such as Visual Basic 6. One of the big things that's changed is we also now support Git clients, and I'll be talking about that. And it includes clients like Xcode, which don't really play well with others. So when we start thinking about Team Foundation Server and the online service, we're th thinking about, well, how do we get access to what's available? Microsoft acquired a company a couple years back, around 2010, that had built their own client as well as a plugin for Eclipse. Microsoft acquired the client and rebranded the technology as Team Explorer Everywhere. This basically gives you a morally equivalent experience inside Eclipse that Microsoft has created for developers inside Visual Studio, which means you can track your work, you can check in and check out files, you can execute builds, you can access reports. Basically gives you a full featured experience inside the Eclipse IDE, which is great for developers on Windows doing Java, for example. But as you can see here, I'm using a Mac, and yes, I'm running OS X Mavericks, and I'll be able to use Eclipse on this platform to connect to Team Foundation Service, just as if I was using Visual Studio. Um, in this package, it uh, supports Windows, OS X, uh, multiple flavors of uh, Linux, as well as some Unix flavors. They even have a command line client, so if you uh, prefer that type of experience, you can work with the server in, in that regard. The other good thing about it is they originally did charge for it um, for the product as well as your server license, uh, server access license, which Microsoft calls a cow. Now all you need to do is provide the cow, which means if you, for example, are a developer who does Windows sometimes and does Visual Studio and has an OSTN subscription, you're already covered. You don't have to spend the extra money to have a great experience on OS X. Um, that said, if you are coming at it completely, say, I'm not doing anything but Java, I'm not going to have an instance subscription, Microsoft does have options where you can buy a straight out Cal, or you can buy what they call a platform subscription, which gives you access to the server and some of the core features. Now, the other thing I want to talk about before I do some demos is web access. 
Right? Microsoft over the years have been known to heavily push a Windows-based experience, native clients uh, for doing things and having access to their servers from a non-Windows platform often was secondary. Well, as you probably have noticed over the last few years, and particularly in the announcement that happened last week with iPad, sorry, Office for iPad, Microsoft really has changed how they view the world. And so the web-based experience that Microsoft has put on top of the Team Foundation server the last couple of releases is amazingly rich and functional, completely in a web browser that is simply standard-based, which means HTML5 and JavaScript. No ActiveX plugins, no Silverlight, nothing special or funky. You can just use it from a browser. And in fact, that combination in conjunction with Eclipse and or your favorite Git client means you can have the first class experience as a developer on a non-Microsoft platform talking to a set of Microsoft services. And that's pretty compelling. And what we're gonna see here is that this new version that's available on Visual Studio Online or Team Foundation Server 2013 gives you full rich access to managing work items, tracking all your different types of work, team interaction through team rooms, the ability to work with builds, the ability to do web-based testing is all something that's built into the product. So let's take a look at how you get started. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do here, let me get my browser. So here you see I'm using Chrome, and I'm gonna access my account at visualstudio.com. So today the way it works is you need to have an account set up. This is really equivalent to defining a server. From a technical aspect, Team Foundation Server in the cloud is a completely re-architected and rebuilt from the ground up cloud-based service. Microsoft isn't just taking Team Foundation Server and running it in a bunch of virtual machines up in the cloud. They rebuilt the core infrastructure, the security setup, the way version control works, all of the cloud-based. For example, out of the box you get uh, geo redundancy for your data storage across three different data centers. Um, today, right now, their main data center is, uh, for access is out of the, what they call the North Central Data Center out of Chicago. But they are working on rolling out worldwide access to data centers where you'll be able to choose. And so, for example, if you're here in Europe, you'll be able to pick, for example, a Northern Europe data center, uh, either one out of Ireland or one out of um, Amsterdam. For um, particularly if you're worried about certain regulations about where you store your assets, et cetera. Um, so that's uh, pretty compelling. So I already have an account, so if I go there, it's going to ask me to log on. Now, one thing you do need that is very Microsoft is a Windows Live ID. If I come over here and we go over to Safari, and we go to tfs.visualstudio.com, you can see there's an option to sign up for free. Now, if I click sign out here, I can show you a basic sign-up process. Just a second, log me out. So there's a couple ways to do There's this free Visual Studio option here. There's also Get Start for free. It turns out, depending on which one you click, gives you a different experience. If we do the free green one, it's going to ask me for who I am, and I'll use my son's Bob ID. Code. Okay, so this is, uh, it, is the one experience. Now, the difference between the two is the stuff that you see in the middle and on the right hand side. When you click that green option to sign for free, you're saying, hey, I want to try this out, and I don't even have anything Microsoft related. And so they're trying to get you to try the latest version of the tooling, et cetera. Um, this is a little annoying because if you don't want this, you have to click it, and then it will, you can cancel the download. So what I like to do is do the other one. So we'll go back over. And I'm sure you guys, honestly, I think they do change it around depending on which one you click. So we'll try the other option. 
get started for free here. So I'll have to log in again. And this time you notice I just get a picture here. So key thing is regardless of which one you pick, same core things are happening. The difference was the first one, they're going to make it you start a download to actually start the creation process. Here I can create the account and tell them to sign off, but I don't want anything extra. Now, the first thing that they're going to want is if they don't know who you are and you don't own an account, they're going to ask you for your name. They want your contact email, and then they want to know where you're at. And then finally, you need your account URL. So I can say something like Dev Week. Well, first of all, I'll do something like MCW, which is already used. And when I click Create Account, it's going to say, hey, it's a new source reserve. On the other hand, if I pick something else, like Brent Randall, and click Create, it's going to create the account. The only thing that's different from what I'm already showing you is that I have a lot of data and stuff on my, start, on my main account page. The whole account creation process takes anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute or two, depending upon how many people are doing account creation, et cetera, at the same time as you, and where in the world you're at. Um, other than that, you'll end up with a start page very similar to what I have here. Uh, these things up here I've left because I demo this a lot. Same thing with application insights. Obviously the recent list for your first time will not have anything there. Okay? And so you basically start at this new setup. The other thing I'll point out that's not going to be there is this your account is an early adopter account. Uh, if you sign up today, you're not an early adopter, you're signed up to there. And you'll have to basically sign up for a free account. A free account gives you access to the basic services for free for up to five users. That includes 60 minutes of free build time a month, um, and access to the core features. If you want access to some of the more advanced features, which I'll point out, so things like Team Room, uh, Enterprise Agile features, et cetera, then you need to either have a Minnesota subscription, or you need to sign up for one of the paid accounts. Uh, the bottom line is, from a cost standpoint, the Minnesota subscription route is most cost effective. You basically get free access based upon the version you have. If you have premium, test, professional, or ultimate, you get access to all of the server-side features. And then you get access to additional features if you have one of the more advanced features like ultimate, which gives you load testing access. So it's really meant to be attractive for the small team and for companies that are already invested in Microsoft. If you're coming at it from a pure iOS development side, excuse me, or say Java, and you're not buying and seeing license at all, you have to weigh your options for this versus other solutions that you might find online. Um, because they haven't done the pricing in an optimized fashion for those type of people, okay? But something to consider. In either case, where you're gonna start is that you're gonna create a team project. So a team foundation server, a team project is the isolation boundary for related work. It lets you have teams, it lets you have multiple projects, whether that be Visual Studio Solutions, or they be Expo projects, Java projects, whatever. You get the choice of methodology you want to use, which will determine which type of work items it creates and the kind of workflow they're going to encourage. It controls what type of version control backing you want. Today, you have to make a choice, either a traditional T Foundation server version control repository, which is the traditional format that they've had, it's centralized, or if you want to use Git repositories as your version control format. Long term, I can see them giving us the ability to have both, because it would make sense to have both, because they both offer some advantages and disadvantages depending upon how you're working, and we'll talk about that in a bit. In either case, I'm gonna go through and create a new team project. We'll call this Dev Week 2014, or just Dev Week 14. And for a description, this is Now, here comes up a couple things you need to be aware of. First of all, the name. Project names cannot be changed, so pick something you like. Uh, moving your data from an existing team project to another one is all possible, but depending upon how you want to move things, for example, do you want to move all your history also, it can be non-trivial at best. Uh, so be careful which names you use. You know, using bad names or code names that then someone's going to want to change later. Uh, if you have someone in your organization who's the management type who decides those kind of things or has a big deal about it, you should let them get involved. Um, description, you can change later. 
Process template is something that today you can only choose one, and then that's it. If you want to change, you have to change later. Uh, but I mean, you have to create a new team project. And the same thing with version control. When you pick your version control type, once you picked it, you can't change it. Now, obviously, some of this stuff is subject to change in the future. That said, the project meeting one we've been asking for since 2006, and we haven't got that one. Uh, so we're not holding our breath, I would say. All right, so we'll get the template. I'll pick the Scrum template, and I'll start with the Team Foundation Server Version Control, and we'll just leave it like that, and click Create Project. So what's happening behind the scenes is they're scheduling a job, and they're gonna go through and allocate some resources, allocate some database space, as well as some storage containers in uh, Azure Blob Storage, and they'll go through and create the team project. project ready to go, and if I click navigate to this project, we'll see I have a new home page. So I'll get rid of this early adopter warning. And what you see here in this top section is areas where you can have additional data. And I'm going to go through and start configuring the project and show you what this looks like. The first thing you want to do is decide who you want to have access. When you go to manage, you have the ability to add new people. Now you can add people as individuals or you can add what are known as VSO groups. Those are something that the account owner would go and create. If I want to add a user, I can start typing their name. For example, I could add my buddy Ian. I could also add, let's see who else is there, um, my coworker, John Flanders. Okay, so these are people that are already there. If someone's not in there, for example, my son, Although I've used it before, let's use my daughter. Right? It will go forward, and if they've never had access to the project, they will get an invitation email inviting them, saying that, hey, Ryan's added you to this project, join up here, and log in with your live ID. The key thing to understand is that people have to have live IDs today. Obviously, from a Microsoft perspective, one of the things they're going to want to provide is Active Directory integration through the Federation, through Windows Azure. That is something that is high in their backlog and something they're working on actively. The architecture of the system supports other identity providers. When they first demoed the service back at Build a couple years ago, Brian Harry logged in with a Yahoo ID. So they have the plumbing to do it. Um, there are various reasons why they haven't done it. One of the reasons is, I've been told, is around SLAs. If you can't log into the system and it's because of your identity provider, who are you going to yell at? Though? You're going to yell at Microsoft because you think it's their fault you can't not Google's fault because your Gmail ID can't be authenticated. Uh, but once again, there's uh, multiple reasons why they haven't done that. So at this point, you must have a live ID. So once you have those live IDs, you can click Save Changes, and it will look up the people and add them to your team project. When you create a team project, you get what's called a default team. You can then add additional teams, and those teams can have their own backlogs as well as their own schedules. So it's a nice way when you're working on large projects to have uh, smaller teams focus on different areas of the product, particularly when they have their own delivery schedules that are independent. If you're going to have one schedule with delivery, it's better just to have one team. Less management, less headache. Now, you may notice that if you look at the members, I have a picture. Um, in fact, let's add someone else who I know does not. And we'll pick Edward Thompson. So you notice Ed shows up as ET. What they've done is they've taken the initials and created a style like bitmap. So those are for anyone who has not set up their profile. Your profile allows you to change a number of things. If you go to my profile, you can, among other things, change your display name, your preferred email address. So while you might use a particular live ID for all your logins, you might not ever check the email that's associated with it. So you can change that so you get email notifications, which are built into the server, uh, to your particular um, preferred address. You can come in and adjust your locale. Mine's at a specific time because that's where I live. 
for credentials, they support something called alternate authentication credentials. And this allows you to log in through from clients and systems that don't support live ID authentication. This is particularly useful for things like Git clients, which is what you would have to set up in here if you're going to use Git from, for example, Xcode. And then finally, you can have connections to other OAuth compatible services. Right now, Microsoft has exposed this through their Azure Websites product, um, but they're looking to make this a wider platform feature so that you can connect to other services. Um, but today it's uh, for Azure. So you come in here and can set up your profile, as well as you can change your picture, and you're good to go. Now that you have your team members added, the next thing you might want to do is come in and define your scheduled iterations. Depending upon the template, these will say either sprints or iterations, but basically they represent time boxes. A period of time for the start and end date that you're going to try and get work done. This is important for the system to help you create things like burn down charts to show you how you're doing on your work. So I'll come up here to the first one, select set dates, and since I just created the project, I'll use today as the start date. And I'll use two week sprints, and we'll save. And I'll go and do another one. And when I go pick the date, they'll provide what they think is the next logical date. And go forward and you can then create other ones as you see fit. Key thing about the service as well as Team Foundation Server is that there's a rich API. Today the API is primarily a managed code API that you access from the uh, libraries that work on Windows or they also have some Java libraries. Long term though, Microsoft is looking to enhance their web services so that they're available both on-premises and in the cloud. There are web services today um, on-premises, but they are older SOAP-based services primarily, and they're undocumented, and Microsoft doesn't guarantee their support. Uh, but knowing and seeing the way the world is moving, uh, particularly towards things like REST and OAuth authentication, Microsoft is looking to enhance that long-term. So I've gone in here, and what I mean by that is you can automate this kind of stuff if you really do this a lot. In either case, you don't need a lot of team projects. One of the mistakes I see people do, particularly on-premises, is they create way too many team projects than they have. Um, a team project is a fairly heavyweight um, artifact, and you can use it for a long time for lots of sprints, lots of iterations, without having to create new ones. Um, some organizations you find it's simply just pure politics and stupidity that creates the extra team projects. But if you can, less, less is definitely more. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna uncheck these other sprints, because I'm not gonna use them right now, and I'm gonna close the dialog and refresh my home page. Now what you'll notice up here is that I now have some dates, but I haven't set up any work yet, so it doesn't know how to show how I'm doing on burn down. Now the second thing you want to do is configure work areas. Work areas let you segment the work items that you create. So if you were building a modern system, you might have code that's related to a backend database. You might have a web service you're working on. You also might have various clients, like an iOS client. An OS 10 client, a Windows client. And so you might want to track the different types of work items you create, the different requirements, the PBIs, the tasks. And so work areas allow you to do things, basically slice and dice them. Um, this is also the feature that allows you to segment work by team. Since I only have one team, I'm not going to worry about it, but we'll do something like UI. And then under new UI, we'll do something like iOS. start thinking about my work. What do I want to get done? But before I do that, I want to point out what's called a team room. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add one more member to this. So I can show you what it's like when I have multiple accounts. So we'll come over here and we'll start up Safari. So we'll sign out.
log in, I'll get my dashboard page as the user. And I'll browse over. And I will pick the new team project, navigate to it. All right, so now I've got two users logged in. Team rooms are interesting in that they serve two purposes. Number one, it provides a place for you to have a digital conversation that becomes a part of the history for your team project. It actually captures all the conversations on a day-by-day -day basis. And this is useful for discussing things among your team about what's going on, why the build broke, maybe some design decisions, things that you might need to track somewhere else but you don't because you have the conversation on email or you have the conversation um, on IM, or worst case, you have it in the hallway, and this becomes some rich oral history that is passed among the dev team, but never gets documented. So it's really nice feature there, so I can say, Brian, are you there? And so what I can do is come over here and pop in here. So I can have that conversation back and forth, and now it's become part of the history. I can go back in time, of course, but there's no one there. And if I click live, that takes me to a kind of day. So this can be interesting, particularly when you have people working different shifts or in different locations. You can get this information documented and have it there for history. The thing I like, though, is the ability to have events. With the events, I can have the system track things that are going on and provide it in the system to tell you what's going on. For example, once I have bills, I can select build definition completion. Code changes, things that are uh, made changes to the repository that are check-ins. Work item updates, as well as code reviews can all be things that can be tracked now in my team room. So now I'll go back to my home page. And what I'm going to do here is go to the backlog. Now, backlog represents all the things that you need to do for your product. Right? It represents the user's wishes, the things they want. As a user, I want a fast system. And so you can quickly add new ones here as you see fit. Now, depending upon where your cursor is, that will affect where the item shows up. Okay? I can then reorder these by simply using drag and drop. I can come over here and double click. This gives me access to it. And I can come over here and fix spelling errors. I can also change who it's assigned to. In addition, I can come over here and talk about those areas. Remember we showed you this earlier? There's our work area. Once we have these areas set for our work items, we can run work item queries that allow us to bring back just a specific set of work items. Okay, and you'll see how that can be interesting in just a bit. Uh, things like charting. Now, iteration specifies when you think you're going to get it done. Okay, naturally, this is Android, so let's just see the area. And we'll say this is something we want to work on in the first sprint. So I'll save and close this. And then we'll come over here and we'll move iOS up to the top. Move this down. And what you're seeing that's happening, or maybe hearing, is if we go back to the team room, we're seeing these events happen. So we get this traceability about what's going on. And once again, you have to determine what level of noise you want to see there. Obviously, at the beginning, when you're first setting up a project, you might have a lot of noise. You might not have it turned on until you get into the project. In either case, as I get my work items set up, I can assign things. I can say that this is actually some of the work that's been approved by the product owner. And of course, I have fields to do things like descriptions. I can use a storyboarding feature to do visual breakdowns. I can link test case. And as you can see, I'll be able to have create subtasks. I can get a full history here, as you'll see, of what happened to this particular work item. So we can see over here discussion only or all changes, which shows you all the state changes. 
The special will only will show you things here. I save it. You'll show, see that shows up in the discussion field. So it's a very rich setup, and there are multiple different types of work items based upon the types. PBIs are requirements, they have tasks, bugs, test cases, um, and as well as uh, feedback work item types and code review. Uh, effort and business value are just arbitrary items. If you think about effort here, you typically want to think of something abstract like story points uh, and have something that's agreed upon. By having an agreed upon effort value, this allows you to track your velocity over time and see how you're able to get a certain amount of features done. So once I've done something like that, I can also do tags. And once I have that, I can do queries on tags. I can use it to filter the screen here from come over here to the filter. I can specify the different tags I want to, to show up. I can say show me all the iOS ones, show me all the phone ones. And you can do things like that. It works really nice. This bar you see here is going to be related to velocity. If we turn on forecast, it's going to say, well, based upon a forecast velocity of 10, you can get everything done because we don't have any history. Once you start having history, you have to write that effort on a consistent value. You'll be able to show you by just looking at the forecast lines how much you can get down per sprint based upon their sort order here. And so I can move that down, et cetera. So if we wanted to, we can say that this has an effort of, uh, we'll say, 10 story points. And we'll change the Android app to be 15 story points. out to be 20 story points. And we'll say fast system is something really large like 50. That may need to be broken down. And so what you see here is that the forecast line is right there. If I go over here to my velocity and say, well, we can get up to, say, I don't know, 30 story points done. Now we see the work we get done, sprint two, sprint three, et cetera. Okay? The number of sprints that will be based upon which sprints you've been able to hear, which was up to the iteration. So it's very flexible, easy to use, and as you can see, I have a great experience in my web browser. I don't need a native client from Microsoft that runs on Windows. Now, one of the things we get also in the product is the ability to have um, a combo board. We're going to put this in our first sprint over here. And if we click on board, we can start visualizing our work from a high level flow perspective. And so, for example, I can say, well, as an Android user, I want this one approved. And I'm going to make this one committed. And what you see here on the side here is the number of work items in progress in that each particular swim lane that you want to support. And what will happen here is this will turn red if you have too many in there at a time. So this provides a visual indicator of the high level at the, at the feature level, what you're delivering, not so much at the lower level. Speaking of features, Microsoft has added higher level work items and PBIs. Right? We often have work that takes longer than just a particular sprint. We might want to group that logically. And so we can come in here and create features. You can also create higher level things called epics. And you can define a relationship between them. So I could, for example, come in here. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Come over to the backlog. Uh, Feature. It's just a different work item type. One of these it has is a target date. We can set that we want it done here. And we'll save it. And then we'll come over here and put it in progress. Then the next thing we can do is come over here and go to our implementation. And we can add additional children. And so we can say, for example, I want to link to an existing child work item, and since it's 12.05, so we'll see 12.04. If I tab, you'll see this is Metro app, so we'll do that one. And we'll do 12.03. That's our Android one. And we'll do 12.02, which would be iOS. Great. And then what this will give us the ability to do is we can see these in a hierarchy. So there's my features, and I can see features to PBIs. And if I had them, I could even have features and tasks, which I don't. You can also do a reverse view. You can come over here and say, I want to view backlog items to features. And we'll go the other direction. The previous version only showed you children of features. If it didn't have a feature associated with it, we lost it. The reverse is here that says, hey, 
here's all the PBIs that are visible, and here's the brand. So lots of flexibility there. You can change columns. You can create queries that you can then use in other products. Uh, particularly Excel is a thing we use often for, for uh, batch modifications and things like that. And to note that the feature board also has a common board so you can see where it's at in the overall process and flow. Now when I go to my sprint, I have a backlog view also, which allows me to come over here and create tasks. And what I need to do is go back to my backlog. I thought I added iOS to sprint, but maybe I didn't. So we go back over here. There we go. If I click plus, And I come over here, and this is where I might think about hours. Let's say that's going to be eight hours. And if I want to, I can break it down into activities. Activities is much more for traditional work. It's not very scrummy, so we'll just leave that away. And also things like the area and the iteration are automatically inherited. All right, and we'll come over here and we'll add those. And what you can do is here, you come to your team, and based upon your team's contribution, you can specify how much capacity they have. As I set their capacity, we see the hour bars increase over here. And if you want to, you can specify the activity, and those will add additional activity bars on the bottom. Once I've done this, as well as doing things like days off, when I go to my board and people start taking on work, I can see if they're overloaded. So I can assign this to Brian. Or if you're doing a more traditional scrum approach, you can pick up the work and set it in progress with things like drag and drop. If we go to the backlog and then go over to our work level, we see that we're not over capacity. But just for giggles, let's you know change the number of hours here to be, you know, five, eight hundred and forty. Watch what happens there. Immediately these bars go red because the team is now overloaded based on the number of hours, as is the individual on their, in this case, Brian. Um, so it gives you a nice visual indication. It's not really a time tracker, it's not an hour tracker, it's just a way to help you with your team planning. It's back to eight. All right. And then so you can have your daily stand-ups, your daily scrum, and see how things are going. People can pick these. Uh, if you're on a touch table screen, this does support touch and drag and drop. And you will get, after a, a day, you'll get your burn down for the sprint. And when you go to the home page, you also start seeing a burn down here for your work. And when you go to the backlog, you have your cumulative flow. Okay. And right now we have a big spike. What we want to see is just a nice continuous flow with fairly even bands, right? We, we don't want to, we always want to see that going on. And then you have your velocity here, which right now is showing 10 based upon um, the work we specified. Now if we go back to our home page, you'll see how this area for pinned items. And one of the things you can do there is you can go over here to your work and you can create pinned items based upon your work item queries. So if you go to your queries, you'll see there's a number of predefined queries in your team project. For example, for the current sprint, we have block tasks. So I can come over here and say, pin that to my home page. In addition, open impediments. These are things that I might be concerned with if I'm a manager or a team member. Same thing with feedback. Now if I go back to my home page, what we're going to see is these blocks that show us the number of items in that particular category. It gives you a nice heads-up dashboard display about what's going on. Now, another thing I can do if I go back to work and then use the new charts feature is I can create a new custom chart. And this can be based upon a particular query that we have, or it can be, um, sorry, it's based on a particular query that we can then define. So we can just go over here and find our queries. And we can find something like, oh, how about, Let's actually do a new query. So we'll first create a new query. And we'll do the work item type as something simple. And then I want to rename this. So we'll say um, all our work items. 
And then we'll go over here and we have to save this to our shared queries. Once we save it to our shared queries, we can then come over here to charts, create a new chart, and we can tell it to group by, for example, who it's assigned to, or the work item type. Since I have work item types, we'll use that to start. And then we'll do another one based upon the same thing. This time we'll group it by who it's assigned to. And then what we can do is go over here to this little tchotchke and we can say pin these to the home page. And so now if we go to the home page. We get this nice heads up display right away for what's going on here. Okay? And it turns out you can pin things like uh, the results of check-ins to your branches, to your repositories, as well as the results of bills it can also be pinned. So you can have a nice build indicator of what's going on. So everything I've done here, very quickly through uh, a large set of the product, is all available through a web browser, so it's available to anybody who can get to it that way. Any questions? Nope, pretty good, okay. All right, so let's go back to the slides and talk a little bit more about how you get your code in there and how you're gonna do things. So I did something with PowerPoint. Now when we think about modern source code control approaches, right, we have a traditional check and checkout model. And one of the strengths of this is that it works for very large code bases and it really is an enterprise's go-to type of rating control because it provides lots of permission control and the ability to monitor what's going on, okay? Team Foundation Service is part of this out of the box. It's really good for large integrated code bases and really when you want that control over who has access to what, particularly if you want to be very granular about things. When we start thinking about other mechanisms though, edit commit has <coughs> become very popular. One of the big reasons is it provides offline editing support. <coughs> and it makes it easy to work with files that are in version control outside of traditional version control clients, particularly in the case if you're using the foundation server or uh, the online service, Visual Studio or Eclipse, you don't have to use them just use your favorite text editor or your other alternative IDE without having version control get in the way. Um, typically it's good for medium sized code bases and where you have this balance of I still have things centralized but I'm willing to give up some of the notification control as well as exclusivity to those items. And the key thing with you know, edit commit is that I will have to deal with conflicts uh, on a more regular basis. Once again, depends on your user's experience and what makes the most sense for you. So when we think about this, these are both models that are supported by typical centralized version control products, and Team Foundation Server version control supports both of them um, at a rich level. Over the last few years, though, distributed version control has come on in a big way. When we think about distributed version control, one of the first things it does is gives you full offline repositories. Uh, this ability to have portable history where I can look back in time at anything that's been done to the version control on my local machine. Uh, this for developers is, is a great experience. In addition, we have a simplified branching model that allows me to branch in place and not worry about getting permission from the people on the major repository or anything else. Um, typically it's good for modular code bases, often to the point of being very focused. Uh, it's good for integrating with open source since it's been adopted heavily, starting with the Linux community, um, and, but across things like iOS, Windows today, it is just really popular. And highly distributed teams, it works very well because we don't have to worry about a centralized server. It even provides some redundancy in case of centralized failure. We think about distributed version control then, Git has won the battle. There's other products out there, Mercurial is another popular one, but Git has grown exponentially. You know, GitHub has amazing numbers when they talk about people using their online service. Uh, in the millions of people using it for commits. Uh, in particular, it's popular because it's everywhere. And by being everywhere, it's not only a DBCS tool, but it supports it being used as a deployment protocol. Azure website supports it. Heroku supports it. Facebook is using it that way. And so you start thinking about these different options. It became a natural thing to where you have Git support across all platforms that Microsoft had to say, hmm, is this something we want to fight head on? or do we really change our game? 
And so what Microsoft did is they said, look, we give. We're not going to build something ourselves. We're going to integrate Git into our main client, Visual Studio, as well as we're going to make Team Foundation serve a first class central or a, a server for hosting Git repositories. Um, and this really, I think, from the development standpoint, got a lot of attention in the open source community as well in the non-Microsoft platforms because if it really is Git, that means I can use it with any client. Um, when we think about the support for this, Visual Studio supports it as well as the server and the online service. Today, it's defined and scoped based upon a team project, so we can have a server the service with a Team Foundation traditional version control project. And when you do that, you can use Team Explorer, Team Explorer everywhere, and use the various providers and object models to get to the server, as well as use third-party um, environments, such as the Eclipse shell. However, now you have the ability to create a team project and specify Git as a repository. When you specify Git as a repository, you still have access to all those top-level items I showed you. I'm going to create a new team project in just a second, and I'm going to pick Git. All the stuff we saw when I did the work items, the work tracking, all that stuff is available with Git-based repositories. The difference is Microsoft created their own Git provider that hooks into Visual Studio, and then they also started contributing to libgit2 as well as libgit 2 Sharp. Um, that's what's interesting. Even a few people on the Microsoft team have commit privileges to the main Git code base. They're active committers at multiple levels in this community. And that really shows Microsoft's commitment level to this as a long-term feature. It's not something that's going to disappear in the next release. Once we have this, it gives us the ability to have, first of all, local repos, just for our own benefit, which is great when you travel like I do, as well as the ability to connect to other repos, including things like GitHub. You can connect from Visual Studio using Microsoft's integrated experience. It also means, though, that any third party that speaks Git can talk to Team Foundation's server. In addition, Microsoft has something called GitTF, which is a Java-based library that allows you to move data back and forth between Git-based repository and Team Foundation's centralized version control repositories. This is useful when you have teams that have a need for storing large-scale objects inside version control, which Git isn't really optimized for. Git's really optimized for source code. Um, yet you want to have those offline abilities and the flexibility that Git gives you. You can even do that with a little bit of work. So let's take a look at using the various version control options. So first off, let's come over here and connect to this existing team project. So I'm going to start Eclipse. We'll click OK. And I'm going to come over here and create a new workspace. second. Hello Eclipse, come back. Let's see, we have lots of fun there. Don't like me today. Try and open that up again. Okay. So I'll come over here. I'm going to get rid of the task list. And I'm going to come over here. an existing project I have. And we'll call this um, let's see, archive. And we'll go to my documents. put 
this. server perspective and we'll connect to my server right I connected to this before still there. Eclipse, why you don't like me today? One more time. Project collection and we'll come down here and find our dev team project. I picked the wrong import name. All right. Truth be told, I did not spend time. There we go. I picked the wrong option. There we go. There we go. And we'll select finish. All right. Share the project with Team Foundation server. Bless you. And we'll come over here and we'll tell we want to put it in a folder called main called building service. Click finish. And what this is going to do, since we're using traditional team foundation server control, it's going to create a set of pending changes. And if I come over here, look at this task list, open this window up a little further, you'll see I have a set of pending changes that are ads. We'll click check in.
yes, I want to import or check in all those files. Okay, so I now create a change set. And a few things to note about this experience is we get detailed and rich information in a native client experience. So I can see what I checked in, all the different files. Yet I can also come over here and see all my work, just like I did when I was using the web interface. So I have the ability to come over here and run my queries. For example, all my work items. So I can run that. I can open up a task and see the detailed information there see all the history, all the stuff I want, and I don't have to context switch. So it's a nice experience that when I'm working with Team Foundation server or service from Eclipse, I get that really nice experience just like I would if I was using Visual Studio. Now let's go over here and we'll just pick this readme file. So we'll update that file. We'll come back over here, go to pending changes. We'll see that the file's been there made an update. And this is just so I can show you some history. Now I can of course do all the history you'd expect there, but if I go over here to Chrome, one of the things you'll notice we have the code hub. If we go to the code hub, I have access to whatever I've checked in through my web browser, and I can look at files online Okay, so I can look at it. I can also come over here and look at a file and compare it between versions. Okay, so let's see my check-in, my not finished. I, oh, you know what happened, I bet? This dialogue that makes no sense. Yes, I am sure. Please check in my change. Great, we'll go back over and we'll come over here to this file come back to README, and when we compare, we get inline diffing right within the web browser. We can see the history for the file, who made the changes, and of course, I can look at the contents. So really nice experience right within your web browser. You can come over and look at change sets, see all the history based upon a particular folder or item selected, and you have the ability to say, you know what, give me this particular folder as a zip file uh, based upon the current change set. So a lot of really nice uh, tools built into the web browsing experience. Now, once you have something set up in Eclipse, one of the things you might want to do beyond all the stuff I've already shown you is builds. Team Foundation service, uh, um, excuse me, <coughs> Team Foundation server will support doing Java builds if you set up your own build. You just have to set up a Windows server, install Java, and configure it. Uh, in the cloud, they've made it even easier in that just by running the build definition, if you run and run either a Maven-based or a Java, or excuse me, an Ant-based build definition, you can create a new build with a few clicks. So you simply come over here to the build workspace, select new build definition, and you want to give it a name. And the trigger, there's a lot of different trigger choices. Naturally, manual run on demand, continuous integration based upon every check in, they'll kick off a build. Rolling builds will accumulate builds for a period of time and then kick off a build. Gated check in, which is the ability to take the code chain that you have and apply it to the latest tip of the server, run the build as well as any unit test and validation you have. If the build fails, it'll be rolled back and your, the check in will not succeed. On the other hand, if it does succeed, they check in on your behalf at the server level. So it helps prevent bad check-ins. It was mainly designed for teams that have lots of people. For example, Microsoft. In DevDiv, they have a few thousand people checking in. Well, if, if every good developer only breaks the build once a year, how often is the build broken at Microsoft? Right, all the time. Um, if you're doing Agile and you're new to builds or you're trying to mature a team, Gated check-ins can be a little dangerous. It can hide a smell where a developer's not doing the right thing before they check in. Um, so you might want to just consider a regular continuous integration build. And of course, you can do scheduled builds. We'll just leave this manual for now. Now for source setting, you're basically telling it what data has to be pulled from your version control onto the build server. 
So we only want to pull down what's necessary, so we'll come over here and drill down and select the folder that contains our particular project. Uh, this, of course, would be more interesting if we had more projects, but it's a good way to get started. Then the next thing you want to do is control where it builds from. Now notice I have this controller here labeled PPE7. One of the things you can do with a server is you can set up one or more build agents on premises. This is useful if you have specialized build environments that can't be done in the hosted environment. Maybe you're using a third party library that requires a hardware dongle. Or maybe it's a more specialized project type they don't support. Um, you can do that. However, in this case, I want to use the hosted build controller. And I'm going to tell it to copy the build output to the server. This will be something that I can go download later as a zip file if I want. Finally, I have to tell it what I'm going to build. And so I just come in here and browse. And what I'm going to do here is, oh, sorry, I need to click Create. If I click Create, I tell it what type of build file I'm going to use. In this case, I'm going to use an existing ant build file. And I'll select the build file here. And notice the nice thing, they've got Java and ant all set up. You can do custom configuration if you want. I don't, so I'll select finish. And what they're doing is they're creating a configuration file that the build engine on the server understands based upon the ant data. And we can set our retention policy, which means how long we keep the builds and the build data around. Click OK. And now I have a new build definition that I can right click and queue up. And we'll give it a second to start up. So you'll see it's now in the queue. We can go back over to our web browser. Will stay up. And if we go to our build hub, what we're going to see here is we now have a new build definition here. We can take a look here in the web browser and see the queued build. And one of the things I can do here is I can pin this to my home page. And what we're going to see here on the home page is another tile, this one, whoops, this one focused on the build status. And we have no build that exists yet, but we do have one in the queue. So if we go back to Eclipse, we come over here and refresh. Okay, now we can see it's actually been kicked off. And so what we can do is come over here and watch the build run and see it go through its various steps. Now while this does this, I'm going to go over and create a new team project using, and what I want to really do is get this a little closer to my browsing order so I quit going back and forth. And we'll come over here to my home, say new team project, and we'll put a G, get based team project. And we'll pick Git, click Create. And we'll go back over here to Eclipse. Look at the log. We can see it's running. It's going through. It's running Ant. You can see I have some warnings from my local Ant build. And the cool thing is that the team build will also pick those up and run them. OK, you can see right there the build validations. We'll go back over to our browser. Our new team project is there. Now, when you get started with a Git-based team project, you don't have any repositories. So what you can do is you can take this address and either use your favorite command line tool or your favorite GUI tool to add code to your repository. So we'll let this finish. And we should be almost done. While that's finishing, we'll fire up Xcode. And what I can do is I can check out an existing project, say allow, and I'll paste in that address. Now, if I haven't ever authenticated, it will pop up a dialog asking me for my credentials. And this is where I have to use those alternative credentials that I showed you earlier. So in this case, it's not my email address, it's just a name. And in fact, you have to be uh, careful right now because the way Xcode works and tries to authenticate, you don't want to make your alternative credentials to look like an email address because they will try and pass that as part of the connection information. 
So you want to stick to something you know, like your name or your email alias without the at sign, whatever works for you. So now I'll specify where I want to put this and we'll call it here Brian R and we'll put this in my G folder. We'll select checkout and we'll come back over. My Xcode likes to do that, there we go. And we'll create a new project. Uh, how about tabbed application is fine. And this is a demo. And we'll come over here and we'll put it up in that folder that I just created from cloning my repo. Click create. I now have my new project. I'll now come over here to source control once it finishes and we'll go check on our build. There we see I have a green build that's been done. And if we go back over to our home page here, Refresh it. Whoops, two fingers, there we go. And now we see the build status. If I click on this, this will take me to the build definition. I can see the history. And if you come over here, you can open the drop folder. And what this will do is say, hey, I'm gonna give you a zip of that drop. Um, you can also specify that you want it stored in version control, so you have lots of flexibility. So that's pretty cool that I was able to do a Java build in a Microsoft uh, server environment. Going back over to Xcode, um, I have a project here. I can go to source control. I can create a local commit. I can then commit those files. I can then come over here, and as we expect, it's super fast, local. We'll save that. And we'll commit that. And we'll commit. And then, naturally, I can then push up to my repo. It's going to push my changes up. And now if we go over here to our web browser, go to our code hub, we now see the contents of our push. And if I go to history, I see the two changes. And as you expect, all the things that you would expect to be available are here. I can come over here and create new branches. I can have additional repositories. I click the drop down here, click manage and I can create a new repository. So all of these you expect in a good Git backend are available in Team Foundation um, server or Visual Studio Online. And I can come over here and if I can come over here and create a new branch here if I want, do all my merging, all the things you'd expect work. And in the case of Xcode, I could use Xcode as an iOS developer or anything else, but I had access to all this other rich information that only is a web browser away. So you can see that's a really good compromise considering that you know, Apple doesn't open up Xcode. In fact, this is one of the reasons that Microsoft looked at supporting Git was there's no way Apple's gonna let them create a plugin that lets you talk to Team Foundation server the way they do from Eclipse, right? And so with Xcode 5, Git is now the default go-to version control uh, for iOS, uh, sorry, for Xcode development, iOS, OS 10, et cetera. So obviously any other IDE that supports Git as a back-end format will work with Team Foundation server or the online service. So I think that really is an, an example of Microsoft's overall commitment. And yes, you can create builds uh, for uh, other Java products, uh, projects using Git as well as traditional Team Foundation server. Now if we go back to the slides, I do want to read up a couple things. So then we'll run this really quick. saw this. Elastic build, it uses Azure VMs. So there's a little delay time from the time you submit build to when it actually runs because they will spin up a fresh VM for you. They want to ensure that none of your data ever gets commingled with anybody else. Um, in addition, they don't have, at this point, dedicated build machines. So that's the way it works. Uh, you can build Java Windows, as you saw, no problem. 
Um, Apple however, doesn't allow OS 10 VMs, therefore you can't use Elastic Build for iOS OS 10 projects. Um, however, if you have your own build server with a little work on your part, you can take your OS 10 build server that you host on premise or you have someone host for you and connect it to your Team Foundation server or the Team Foundation, or excuse me, Visual Studio Online, the service. Um, and there's an article that Microsoft has posted um, at that bit.ly link that you can take a look at. Now, one more thing I was going to talk about. Oh, the last thing is we have something that we might want to test. Now, Microsoft has rich testing tools available if you're doing Windows. But sometimes you just want the ability to do some manual testing. And you don't want the overhead of having to have a user window machine, Windows machine. So one of the great things that Microsoft has done in the service and Team Foundation Server is giving you the ability to do testing from your web browser. So if you go to the test hub, you can come over here and define a new test plan. And a test plan is just a collection of one or more test cases. Test cases usually map to a requirement and you have any number of test runs. So we might want to do you know, manual mobile tests. From there, I can then come over here and create a new test case. And come over here and do a step, start the app, go to page one, let's go to page two, expect a result, it doesn't crash, and we'll fix this. All right, so I can save this. I can then even say it's ready to go. And now if I want to test, I simply come over here and say run. If I say run using client, if I'm on a Windows machine, it will launch the rich Windows test client. And it's really nice because it can let you record video. It will record an action recording of what you're doing if you want, which means you can do step by step. If you're testing against Windows applications that are written in C Sharp, VB Dynamic, et cetera, it can create IntelliTrace files, which help developers find bugs. But in this case, we just want to see if our functionality works, which is turns out one of the most common types of testing that is done. It's a form of user acceptance testing as well as just known as manual testing. When you click run, it fires up this little window that you can then break out into its own window. I'm in full screen, so I decided to do that. So I can say start the app, so I can come over here to Xcode. And it looks like my screen resolution just totally went bonkers, didn't it? Sorry about that. And so if I come over here to my project, run it, and of course this is a tour de force of an app since it doesn't do anything yet. Right, so I come back over here to my test, I can mark this as successful, I went to page one, that was successful, go back over, go to page two, I'm excited, it works, I can then come in here. I can edit in line if I want. I can also come over here and add a comment. And I can even come in and attach screenshots, for example, if I wanted to. All within my web browser, which is a pretty nice setup. Now what's interesting is if you do have the Microsoft Test Tools installed and you have a Windows machine or a Windows VM, you can open up the client and see the rich test results, get access to the reporting data, et cetera, um, that you, um, you don't get today in the web client. But the web client is coming along really well. OK, this is totally bonkers. Let's see if it'll go back to normal for the closing slides. Maybe not. Has the projector just had it with me? Oh, there we go. All right. So hopefully, you know, you really saw that Microsoft has really changed their game. Uh, probably the only other thing they can do to really prove it is they could, you know, either build their own ID that runs on other platforms or buy something like Xamarin and uh, start shipping that as a Microsoft product. 
But really, Team Foundation Server is your ALM hub for Windows developers, but really just about any modern platform developer. Between Git-based source code control and the fact that all the core ALM features are available through a web browser, any web browser, I use Chrome, Safari works, Opera works, Firefox works, and of course, Internet Explorer all work fine to give you access to a majority of the features you would need to be an active participant in a team. With that, I thank you very much for coming to this session. And if you have any questions now or later, you can ask them. And here's my contact information. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks a lot.